that hotep that hotep that hotep Jesus dude. What up, y'all? Hotep. Hope y'all feeling well. All good and gravy. So we're gonna run through Wall Street's involvement in World War II. It's a lot. It's a lot to cover. I don't cover everything. I cover the uh, the stuff that, that that the mainstream normies can't refute, essentially. Um, remind me to highlight Bush. I did not highlight Bush in the book because, well, I thought most people that I wanted to red pill with this already knew about it. So remind me at the end to talk about the Bush family. Talk about Prescott Bush. It's a lot of information. I'm going to try and go through it as fast as possible. And um, only pause on the, on the parts that are most alarming. Obviously, we're going to talk about the financing. We're also going to talk about how people weren't held responsible for the financing. What pushed Germany into the war? Um, and also how um, U.S. companies in Germany never became bomb targets, even though they were producing arms and manufacturing arms. <clears throat> so, without further ado, let's hop into today's presentation. Nineteen thirty nine, Wall Street finances Hitler. Some of you um, know about this stuff, might not have the details. You will have the details today. If you don't have the details or don't know about this, you'll be double you'll be double pilled today. <clears throat> Thank you everybody for joining the presentation. And uh let's begin. First thing I like to do is uh, start off with a quote. Sorry, uh, I like to start off with. Uh, let me organize my screen really fast. Cool. Let me start off with a quote here by uh, FDR to Edward House. He says, "The real truth of the power is, as you and I know." that a financial element in the larger centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson. And I am not wholly accepting the administration of Woodrow Wilson. The country is going through a repetition of Jackson's fight with the Bank of the United States only on a far bigger and broader basis. So the first question I ask you is, as you hear me, <clears throat> recite that quote from FDR to Edward Mandel House. Do you yourself believe that the government we live under today is any different than that of Andrew Jackson and the one that FDR warned us of? I'd like you to deliberate in the chat and tell me how you feel about that. <clears throat> is it relevant today? So let's continue. Three years after Hitler came to power, William Dodd, United States Ambassador to Germany, wrote to FDR on October 19th, 1939, from Berlin. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not going to read the whole quote here. He says there are uh, more than 100 American corporations have subsidiaries here or cooperative understandings. The DuPonts have three allies in Germany that are aiding in the armament, armament business. Their chief allies are D. Farben Company part of the government, which 
gives 200,000 marks a year to one propaganda organization operating on American opinion. Standard Oil, a New York sub company, sent 2 million here in December 1933 and has made $500,000 a year helping Germans make ersatz gas for war purposes. He continues and says, but Standard Oil cannot take any of its earnings out of the country except in goods. I'll pause right there. Uh, I'd rather prefer to take out um, my gains in goods <clears throat> and then money. But let's continue. Uh, those of you who watch this channel or have a strong monetary background understand uh, why uh, that is better. They do little of this, report their earnings at home, but do not explain the facts. The International Harvester Company president told me their business here rose 33% a year. I believe that was for arms manufacturing, but they could take nothing out. Even our airplanes, people have secret arrangement with Krupps. German Motor Company and Ford do enormous business here through their subsidiaries and take no profits out. I mention these facts because they, they complicate things and add to war dangers. Again, that is uh, FDR on October 39th. I'm sorry. Um, that is uh, William Dodd to FDR, October 19th, 1939 from Berlin. Next slide. Uh, t January 23rd, a diary entry by Ambassador Dodd questions the Standard Oil and Germany connection says here, uh, the Standard Oil Company of New York, the parent company of the vacuum, has spent 10 million marks in Germany trying to find oil researches, resources and build a great refinery near the Hamburg Harbor. I'm not going to read the rest of that. I'll skip here. It says, why did the Standard Oil Company of New York send $1 million over here in December 1933 to aid the Germans in making gasoline from soft coal? for war emergencies. He continues and says, why do the international harvester people continue to manufacture in Germany when their company gets nothing out of the country when it has failed to collect its war losses? He saw my point and agreed that it looked foolish and that it only means greater losses if another war breaks loose. So I wrote, to understand why a corporation would engage in a profitless deal, you would have to understand power. I'm going to recite Carol Quigley, Tragedy and Hope. And uh, if you watch this channel and following along, you're familiar with uh, why money is not of interest to the powers that be. Most people say, why do the powers that be? You know, all they want is money, and that's actually not true. What they want is power. And we're going to recite Carol Quigley here. He says the apex of the system was to be the bank for international settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private owned, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. Each central bank in the hands of men like Montagu, Norman of the Bank of England, Benjamin Strong of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, Charles Rist of the Bank of France, uh, Haljamar Schott of Reichsbank, Reichsbank sought to dominate its government by its ability to control treasury bonds, to manipulate foreign exchanges, to influence the level of economic activity in the country, and to influence cooperative politicians by subsequent economic rewards in the business world. So again here, these people don't mind taking losses because those losses will be gained by controlling the economy. So they'll make it more than back by controlling the economy. They'll make probably 10x if not more. Next slide. If you want power, play the long game. Short sightedness yields short results. This is why the powers that be have such a strong staying power. They make decisions with a 100 plus year outlook in mind. The official story would have you believe that the arming of Germans was accidental. Here is a statement from the Kilgore community. It says here the United States accidentally played an important role in the technical arming of Germany. So here, Kilgore Camp Committee says, oh, it was an accident that we armed the Germans. <laughs> it's an accident. Although the German military planners had ordered and persuaded manufacturing corporations to install modern uh, equipment for mass production, neither the military economists nor the corporations seemed to have realized the full extent of what that meant. 
The eyes were opened when two of the chief American automobile company companies uh, built plants in Germany in order to sell in, in the European market without the handicap of ocean freight charges and high German tariffs. Germans were brought to Detroit to learn the techniques of specialized production of components and of straight line assembly. So they brought the Germans here to learn. What they saw caused further reorganization and refitting of other key German war plants. The techniques learned in Detroit were eventually used to construct the dive bombing Stutzkas. At a later period, IG Farben representatives in this country enabled a stream of German engineers to, re to visit not only not only plane plants, but others of military importance in which they learned a great deal that was eventually used against the United States. So I ask you again, deliberate in the chat, deliberate in the comments. If you're watching the replay, do you believe that all of this could have been done by accident? So the book continues. I'm reading from my book, The Patriot Report. I'm asking the conspiracy of money and war or exposing the conspiracy of money and war. And it says, in 1934, Germany only produced 300,000 tons of natural petroleum products and less than 300,000 tons of synthetic gasoline. A decade later, and with the transfer of hydrogenation patents and technology from Standard Oil of New Jersey to IG Farben, Germany produced about 6.5 million tons of oil, of which 85% was synthetic oil using the Standard Oil hydrogenation process. Access to patents. So, um, Anthony C. Sutton wrote this wonderful book called uh, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler. He also wrote one, I believe, on Wall Street, Financial and Bolshevik Revolution. I strongly suggest you read both of those. So I'm going to pull here from uh, Sutton, the Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler. It says the control of synthetic oil output in Germany was held by the IG Farben subsidiary. Uh, some German name. You can read it in the book. Um, and this uh, Farben cartel itself was created in 1926 with financial uh, with Wall Street financial assistance. Uh, shout out to the people that do cash at me and pay the tuition in, in, uh, in, um, on cash app. Uh, also uh, in Bitcoin, um, people who sometimes send me Bitcoin through cash app. I appreciate you for uh, paying your tuition. Shout out to Khalid Cooper and uh, Pariah the Boneless. Uh, if you would like to pay tuition through YouTube and Super Chats, I will welcome that and you know, this will be read live and you will be a part of history because so few people cover these type of things on YouTube and they're hard to find. Sort of like the Monetary Control Act of 1980 to which the keyword string I do own now. Let's continue. Uh, from the section on the Federal Reserve, uh, I'm talking about the section of the Federal Reserve of this book, Patriot Report. Uh, Paul Warburg, uh, you might recall the name Paul Warburg, I'm sorry. Now he has a brother named Max and Max sat on the board of American IG Farben's wholly owned U.S. subsidiary. So one brother is here, the other one's over uh, sitting on the board in Germany. So Sutton says, in addition to Max Warburg and Hermann Schmitz, the guiding hand in the creation of the Farben empire, the early Farben Vorstand, including Karl Bosch, Fritz der Mer, Kurt Oppenheim, and George von Schnitzler, all except Max, Max Warburg were charged as war criminals after World War II. How did Max sidestep prosecution? Is this the privilege of being connected to the banking elite? This is what Sutton comments and asks. The IG Farben and Wall Street connection is a damning one that demands proper investigation by anyone who seeks truth. Sutton claims that IG Farben's directors helped bring Hitler and the Nazis to power in 1933. He charges Farben with contributing 400 Reichsmarks to Hitler's political, and he says, quote unquote, slush fund. Sutton continues, he says, it was a secret fund which financed the Nazi seizure of control in March 1933. Many years earlier, Farben had obtained Wall Street funds for the 1925 cartelization and expansion in Germany and $30 million for American IG in 1929 and had Wall Street directors on the Farben board. It has to be noted that these funds were raised and directors appointed years before Hitler was promoted as German dictator. We'll continue. Let you speculate in your mind and see what's going on here. So there's a military uh, affairs hearing included. 
the following uh, statement. It says, without IG's immense productive facilities, its intense research and vast international affiliations, Germany's prosecution of the war would have been unthinkable and impossible. Farben not only directed its energies toward arming Germany, but concentrated on weakening her intended victims. And this double-barreled attempt to expand the German industrial potential for war and to restrict that of the rest of the world was not conceived and executed in the normal course of business. The proof is overwhelming that IG Farben officials had full prior knowledge of Germany's plan for world conquest in each specific aggressive act later undertaken. Sip some of my Hotep juice. So I continue in the book. I said these same hearings concluded that the technology and the production of ISO octane was essential for aviation fuels actually came from the U.S. And I quote here. Um, this is uh, from Elimination of German uh, Resources for War, page 943. In fact, entirely, the Americans have become known to us in detail in its separate stages through our agreements with them, Standard Oil New Jersey, and is being used very extensively by us. Another element essential for the production of aviation gasoline was tetraethyl lead. Uh, this was also obtained by Farben from the U.S. Also, Standard Oil in 1939 sold $20 million worth of high-grade aviation gasoline to Farben. More on the Standard Oil connection later. Uh, Sutton states that out of 43 major products manufactured by IG Farben, 28 were of primary concern to the German armed forces. Farben also produced 95% of the Zyklon B gas, which was used in the concentration camps. <music> Did Wall Street, by proxy, finance the Holocaust? Hmm. Well, we have to ask ourselves. Wall Street? Well, we have IG Farben, and you have an IG Farben subsidiary, which lives in Germany, and they produce 95% of Zyklon B gas. And this is the same thing they use to gash our beloved Jewish friends. Next slide. Under interrogation, Farben director Von Schnitzler admitted to having knowledge of these practices. It was questioned, they said, what did you do when they told you that IG chemicals were being used to kill, to murder people held in con concentration camps? He responds, I was horrified. They said, did you do anything about it? He said, I kept it for myself or to myself because it was too terrible. I asked Mueller Conradi, is it known to you and Ambrose and other directors in Auschwitz that the gases and chemicals are being used to murder people? They asked, what did he say? He said, yes, it is known to all IG directors in Auschwitz. Let's continue. The Farben and Wall Street connection would manifest its power on U.S. soil in the form of economic warfare. The investigation reports... The story, in, the story in short is that because of Standard Oil's determination to maintain an absolute monopoly of synthetic rubber developments in the United States, it fully accomplished IG's purpose of preventing United States production by dissuading American rubber companies from undertaking independent research and developing synthetic rubber processes. This is the stunting of um, economic, I'm sorry, uh, American technology. Slide. So we have here the Farben agent, Dr. Oscar Loyal, in 1945 admitted that Farben and Standard Oil of New Jersey colluded in a preconceived plan to suppress development of the synthetic rubber industry in the United States to the advantage of the German Wehrmacht and to the disadvantage of the United States in World War II. His testimony reads, is it true? This is, their, this is him under questioning. So they asked, they said, is it true that while the delay in divulging the synthetic rubber processes to American rubber companies was taking place, um, we're in the meantime keeping IG well informed in regard to 
synthetic rubber developments in the U.S.? And he responds, yes. So they ask, so that at all times, IG was fully aware of the state of the development of the American synthetic rubber industry? And he responds, yes. So I continue in the book, The Patriot Report, and I say, is there room to find innocence amongst the Farben Consortium? Sutton removes any doubt. And he says, Farben was an initiator and operator for the Nazi plans for world conquest. Farben acted as a research and intelligence organization for the German army and voluntarily initiated Wehrmark projects. In fact, the army only rarely had to approach Farben. It is estimated that about 40 to 50% of Farben projects for the army were initiated by Farben itself. We have the testimony by Dr. Von Schnitzler. And uh, he doesn't provide much room for innocence here. And he says, uh, thus, acting as it had done, IG contracted a great responsibility and constituted a substantial aim in the chemical domain and decisive help to Hitler's foreign policy, which led to war and the ruin of Germany. Thus, I must conclude that IG is largely responsible for Hitler's policy. So I ask, how does a corporation get away with such acts without any type of repercussions? The answer is simple. You hire a PR agent. IG Farben hired the same public relations firm as the Rockefellers, Ivy Lee and TJ Ross of New York. This is the same firm that produced the propaganda document USSR to clean up the image of the Soviet Union while labor camps, labor camps were fully functioning. His job with IG Farben was to counter criticism leveled at IG Farben within the United States. The power of public relations agents. So in the 1934 testimony, test, testimony sorry, to the U.S. Congress House of Representatives, Special Committee on Un-American Activities, Investigation of Nazi Propaganda Activities, and Investigation of Certain Other Propaganda Activities, Lee confirmed that IG Farben was affiliated with the American Farben firm. The American, he says, quote, unquote, the IG, the American IG is a holding company with directors, such people as Edsel Ford, Walter Teagle, one of the officers of the city bank. And um, I have an exchange here, uh, which I'm um, going to skip to the bottom of this whole entire exchange. You can read the book, but he's uh, Mr. Dickenstein. Is, uh, actually, let me go here. Um, Actually, I'll read this entire exchange. I'm sorry. Mr. Dickenstein, have you received or has your firm received any propaganda literature from Germany at any time? Mr. Lee says, yes, sir. Mr. Dickenstein asks, and when was that? Mr. Lee said, we, oh, we have received. It is a question of what you call propaganda. We have received an immense amount of literature. Mr. Dickenstein says, in other words, you received this material that deals with German conditions today. You examine it and you advise them. It has nothing to do with the German government, although the material, the literature, is official literature of the Hitler regime. That is correct, is it not? Mr. Lee says, well, a good deal of the literature was not official. Mr. Dickenstein, it was not IG literature, was it? Mr. Lee says, no, IG sent it to me. Mr. Dickenstein asks, can you show us one scrap of paper that came in here that had anything to do with the IG? Mr. Lee says, oh, yes, they issue a good deal of literature, but I do not want to beg the question. There is no question, whatever, that under their authority, I received an immense amount of material that came from official and unofficial sources. Mr. Dickenstein says, exactly. In other words, the material that was sent here by the IG was material spread. We would call it propaganda by authority of the German government. But the distinction that you make in your statement, as I take it, the German government did not send it to you directly that it was sent to you by IG. Mr. Lee responds, right. Mr. Dickenstein says, and it had nothing to do with their business relationships just now. Mr. Lee says, that is correct. So basically what we have here is IG Farben playing an intermediary between the Hitler regime. And, um, and his, and his um, 
Well, IG Farben playing the middleman um, between. Um, let me get this right here. Oh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee. Uh, I can't remember who Mr. Lee represents. You can read the book and you'll, and you'll be able to see it. Um, but Mr. Lee, I believe Mr. Lee represents um, some interest in Germany. I believe it was American. Um, the, I, the American IG firm included the following agents, and you'll see on the next slide here the list of agents and all of their affiliations. Boom, bong, boom. Next. Uh, in order to understand um, World War II, you have to study the Treaty of Versailles uh, and also note the Dawes Plan. So, Carol Quigley uh, notes the, the Dawes Plan. He says, the Dawes Plan, which was largely a J.P. Morgan production, okay, was drawn up by International Committee of Financial Experts presided over by the American banker, Charles G. Dawes. It was concerned only with Germany's ability to pay and decided that this would reach a rate of 2.5 billion marks a year after four years of reconstruction. During the first four years, Germany would be given a loan of 800 million and would pay a total of 5.17 billion marks in reparations. This plan did not supersede the German reparations obligation as established in 1921. And the difference between the Dahl's payments and the payments due to the London schedule were added to the total reparations debt. Thus, Germany paid reparations for five years under the Dawes plan and owed more at the end than it had owed at the beginning. So if you want to know, like, what infuriated, um, you know, what infuriated um, um, the Germans into uh, going into war, uh, that is your answer. Okay. Um, oh, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I did have that right. Lee represents, um, I believe this would be, um, uh, so you have IG Farb in America and then you have IG Farb in Germany. And I believe Lee represents IG Farb in America and, um, and then German, um, so IG Farb in Germany was, was, was the transmitter of official, um, Hitler documentation to this Mr. Lee. Uh, okay, so uh, Sutton, as you know, uh, author of Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, Sutton writes that these loans were utilized in the mid 1920s to create and consolidate the gigantic chemical and steel combinations of IG Farben and uh, another German company, Veringete Stahlwerke. Uh, sorry for my German. Uh, these cartels not only helped Hitler to power in 1933, they also produced the bulk of key German war materials used in World War II. Uh, Chad Lemoyne, thank you. Um, he says, late to the party, but paying my tuition and saying thanks again for an amazing show last night. That was a blast. Keep your koofies on tight, people. Yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Shout out to everybody in the chat. Hope you're having fun. Please don't argue too much. <sighs> Let's continue. Uh, the IG Farben and Standard Oil Connection gave Germany a monopoly on gasoline production during World War II. Sutton says that synthetic gasoline and explosives were, quote unquote, two of the very basic elements of modern warfare. He highlights that the control of German World War II output, output was in the hands of two German combines created by Wall Street loans under the Dawes plan. We're gonna, it's going to get broken down in a second here, so just be, be patient. It says, following the Dawes plan came, let me put this on your screen, the Young Plan of 1928, which was devised by the Morgan agent, Owen D. Young. So when you say uh, Morgan agent, I'm talking about J.P. Morgan. Describing his plan, Sutton wrote, the Young Plan was assertedly a device to occupy Germany with American capital and pledge German real assets for a gigantic mortgage held in the United States. So again, people, you know, it's not really about money. It's more about power, putting this nation into debt and saying, you owe us, you are under our thumb. So he continues, he says, the United European Venture 
was a vehicle to speculate and to profit upon the imposition of the Dawes plan and, and it's clear evidence of private financiers, and he says, including FDR, using the power of the state to advance their own interests by manipulating foreign policy. Again, this is about power. I continue, I wrote, allegedly it was this young plan that brought Hitler to power. Nazi industrials, industrialist Fritz Dyson writes, I turned to the National Socialist Party only after I became convinced that the fight against the young plan was unavoidable if complete collapse of Germany was to be prevented. So it was basically saying, yo, because of this young plan, uh, Germany is probably going to be completely disheveled, have a, com uh, a completely um, destroyed economy. Many people will suffer and die. And as uh, German loyalists, they said, we have to do something about this. So this is uh, what this gentleman says is the reason for Germany wanting to go to war because the young plan and the dolls plan were just unfair um, policies. So let's uh, talk about Owen D. Young really fast. Again, we already mentioned that he's one of JP Morgan's agents. Um, so let's run through Owen D. Young's positions that he held. First, he was president of General Electric Chairman of the Board of General Electric Company in New York, Chairman of the Executive Committee of Radio Communication of America, Director of both German General Electric, which is AEG, and Osram in Germany. He also served on the Board of General Motors, NBC, and RKO. To finalize his long list of powerful positions, he was Counselor of the National Industrial Conference Board, a director of the International Chamber of Commerce and deputy chairman of the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. <laughs> Bro, he must have been Jamaican because I don't know how he got all these jobs. <laughs> Good morning, Montoya. Oh my God, this is, uh, this is so wild. Um, Let's continue. The other Morgan agent at General Electric was General Swope, president and director of German, uh, I'm sorry, president and director of General Electric Company, as well as French and German associated companies, including AEG and Osram in Germany. Swope was also director of RCA, NBC, and National City Bank of New York. The other Morgan agent on the board of General Electric was Thomas Cochran. So think about this. You have these guys who are running motor companies, um, uh, radio communication companies, um, media companies, NBC, um, the Federal Reserve, um, uh, power companies, General Electric, right? Utilities companies. So like every single piece of like major piece of your life that is controlled by some corporation or organization, like this guy sat on the board of these guys sat on the board or we, or was a director of some sort. It's a lot of, I would call that centralization of power, AKA communism. Let's continue. So I said, if we follow the money, we find that in August of 1929, it was confirmed that 14 million marks of common AEG, this is uh, the German General Electric stock were to be issued to General Electric. So this is why sometimes this stuff gets very confusing for me because they set up these like subsidiary companies and they transfer money between the two. So basically they set up AEG in Germany and then issue stock to their American company, which when added to shares purchase in the open market gave a gave GE 25% of AEG, which later increased to 30%. The two firms also signed an agreement which gave AEG access to technology and patents while five Americans were on board of AEG. So let's break that down really fast. Uh, so AEG has access to American patents through GE, the American parent company, and the German company, AEG, has five Amer Americans on their board. Okay, uh, let's continue. A well-known liberal German newspaper published in Germany 
published in Berlin, the Wassensche Zeitung wrote, the American electrical industry has conquered the world and only a few of the remaining opposing bastions have been able to withstand the onslaught. He doesn't say uh, America. He doesn't say, you know, some country. He says the American electrical in industry. Corporations have conquered the world, is what he says. Sutton summarizes, and he says, I.E.G., okay, so this is another subsidiary. I think they eventually merge. Um, he says, International General Electric, actually, this is a, probably a, another parent company, continued its moves to merge the world electrical industry into a giant cartel under Wall Street control. The Dawes plan required monetary payment of reparations, but the Young plan required payment in goods. Dyson wrote, in my judgment, the financial debt thus created was bound to disrupt the entire economy of the Reich. Uh, Halawi says Hitler was so upset after he fought in World War I uh, because central banks financed all sides of the war and blamed it on them people. Um, yeah. Next slide. Um, for the financial elite, there were always loopholes to be exploited. So German firms with U.S. affiliations were exempt from reparations payment <laughs> via temporary foreign ownership. For example, AEG was tied to General Electric. So um, Henry H. Schloss, Schloss wrote this uh, volume called The Bank for International Settlements. And he says here, he says, the fact that the bank possessed a truly international staff, of course, present a highly anomalous situation in the time of war. An American president was uh, transacting the daily business of the bank through a French general manager who had a German assistant general manager while the secretary general was an Italian subject. Other nationals occupied other posts. These men were, of course, in daily personal contact with each other, except for Mr. McKittrick. They were, of course, situated permanently in Switzerland during this period and were not supposed to be subject to orders of their government at any time. As you know, Switzerland is like a neutral nation. It's like uh, if you ever played tag and it's like base, you know, if you get the base, like nobody can touch you, right? However, the directors of the bank remained, of course, in their respective countries and had no direct contact with the personnel of the bank. It is alleged, however, that H. Schacht, Schacht, Schacht president of the Reich Bank, Reichsbank kept a personal representative in Bosley or Basley during most of this time. Okay, so this evidence appears to show that Hitler's rise to power was actually financed by Wall Street. James Stewart Martin wrote from, and he's quote unquote, he says, his experience as chief of economic warfare section of the Department of Justice investigating the structure of the Nazi industry and his work called All Honorable Me. So this is James Stewart Martin. In the, in the work called All Honorable Me, he says these loans for reconstruction became a vehicle for arrangements that did more to promote World War II than establish peace after World War I. So AEG, a.k.a. German General Electric, received $35 million from National City Company. The American IG Chemical Company, a.k.a. IG Farben, received $30 million from the same firm. United States Steelworks received more than 70 million from Dillon, Reed and Company. The banking firms that financed German reparations were Dillon, Reed and Company, Harris, Forbes and Company, National City Company, Spire and Company, Lee, Higgins and Company, Guarantee Company New York, Kuhn, Loeb and Company, and Equitable Trust Company. Nearly 75% of the loans came from the first three firms listed. The total amount was 826 million and the prof about, and the profits were 10 million, 10.4 million. So, uh, reparations were levied against Germany and then, then bankers come in and like, okay, yeah, we'll finance this. No problem. <laughs> so 
I continue, I said, if you're looking for tangible evidence that the banking elite may have financed Hitler, there is a uh, bank transfer slip dated March 2, 1933 from AEG to Delbruck Schickler uh, and company in, in Berlin, which requests that 60,000 rice marks be deposited in the National True Hunt, a.k.a. the National uh, Trusteeship account for Hitler's use. And Sutton purports that IG Farben contributed 30% of the 1933 Hitler National Trusteeship or Takeover Fund. If you're familiar with uh, World War II history, then you know about the Nuremberg Trials of 1945. And this is kind of funny. It says the uh, Nuremberg Trials 1945 says that only the German directors of AEG were placed on trial. None of the American directors were. So, chat, people watching the replay, tell me in the comments, what do you make of this? None of the American directors were placed on trial, but direct German directors were. I continue, I said the conspiracy gets deeper. We now put into focus another U.S. affiliated German electrical, electrical company, ITT. ITT is International Telephone and Telegraph. And it's going to get uglier. This just gets uglier. Uh, amongst the many targets in the industrial complex that were bombed, ITT and AEG were virtually untouched outside of incidentals during area raids. So I don't know what to think here. It's just like, okay, so military, um, the American military power or whoever else is involved in attacking Germany was like, yeah, let's attack all these spots. But you know, these two spots right here, these two companies, yeah. These should not be targets. Let's not touch that. Like, is the Wall Street power so intertwined with the American government that it's also controlling the military? I don't know. I'm just asking questions here. Please don't pull the vac black vans up uh, at my house. I'm just asking questions. Are we allowed to do that? I don't know. The United States Strategic Bombing Survey determined, in the opinion of Spears' assistants and plant officials, the war effort in Germany was never hindered in any important manner by any shortage of electrical equipment. <laughs> For the AEG plant at 135 Mugenhofer Strasse Nuremberg, they say no serious damage occurred until the raids of February 20th and 21, 1945, near the end of the war. And then protection had been fairly well developed. <coughs> Excuse me. Although 69% of his production was for war by 1944. The January 1947 German electrical company industry report concluded that, concluded that the industry has never been attacked as a basic target system, but a few plants, i.e. Brown Boveri, Boveri at uh, Mannheim, Mannheim, Heim, Bosch at Stuttgart, Stuttgart, and Siemensstadt in Berlin have been subjected to precision raids. Many others were hit in area raids. Let's continue. An allied investigation team known as FIAT concluded on March 31st, 1945, that, AE, that the uh, AEG plant, uh, Ostland plant was immediately available for production of fine metal parts and assemblies after their inspection of the facility, illustrating that the plant's function had not been disrupted by bombing. So even after being attacked, uh, they were up and running. It was like, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. We're good. Keep things rolling. No problems. So no significant damage, basically. So we have here a testimony from James Stewart Martin, which highlights the IG Farb and exclusion from bombing. And his testimony says, Germany, shortly after the armies reached the Rhine at Cologne, we were driving along the West Bank within sight of the undamaged IG Farben plant at Leverkusen across the river. Without knowing anything about me or my business, he, the Jeep driver, began to give me a lecture about IG Farben and to point at the contrast between the bombed out city of Cologne and the trio of untouched plants on the fringe. <laughs> David Zientara, thank you for paying tuition. I appreciate you. You are loved. And I pray that God makes you blessed and highly favored. Thank you. Um, so Sutton continues and he writes, the standard oil group of companies in which the Rockefeller family owned one quarter and controlling interest 
was of critical assistance in helping Germany prepare for World War II. As mentioned previously, it was, it was standard oil that developed the hydrogenation process, which Germany used to manufacture synthetic gasoline. So, how come none of these sites were military targets? Does Wall Street money go deep into the military industrial complex? The Truman, Bone, and Kilgore committees after World War II confirmed that Standard Oil had, at the same time, seriously imperiled the war preparations of the United States. Sutton adds. Okay, so another damning and shocking claim by Sutton involves the Nazi Himmler and his circle of friends. So you might be familiar, might not be familiar with Himmler's circle of friends. He claims that Standard Oil through IG Farben and other German subsidiary companies even added to Himmler's personal fund. The Standard Oil and IG Farben connection was officially organized in December 1929 under the new company, Standard IG Company. In the von, let me pull this up. In the von Knirrem, uh, Farben, he's a basically a Farben official, secret memo. He exposed the dependency of the Germans upon Standard Oil Tech. Uh, he says the closing, uh, actually, I'm not going to read that, but it's just testimony here. You can read that in a book. Um, so he continues in a memo. He says, by reason of their decades of work on motor, motor oils, the Americans were ahead of us in their knowledge of the quality requirements that are called for by the different uses of motor fuels. In particular, they had developed at great expense a large number of methods of testing gasoline for dis different uses on the basis of their experiments, they had recognized the good anti-not quality of iso-octane long before they had any knowledge of our hydrogenation process. This is proved by the single fact that in American, fu that in American fuels are graded in octane numbers and iso-octane was entered as the best fuel with the number 100. All this knowledge naturally became ours as the result of the agreement, which saved us much effort and protected us against many errors. Uh, in 1924, Standard Oil and General Motors formed the Ethel Gasoline Corporation in New York City. On December 15, 1934, they drew the attention of the Army Air Corps in Washington, D.C. They informed E.W. Webb, president of Ethel Gasoline, that I.G. Farben was to manufacture ethyl lead. Without this ethyl lead, lead they say, mobile warfare would be impractical as it was a compound that eliminated knocking and made engines run more efficiently. So, IG Farben made um, the motors that run the mechanical vehicles of Germany running more efficiently, and he says that mobile warfare would be impractical. The Army Corps advised the Ethel Company that under no conditions should you or the board of directors of the Ethel uh, gasoline Corporation disclosed any secrets or know-how in connection with the manufacture of tetraethyl lead in Germany. So, Mr. Webb denied that the tech would be transferred in a statement of facts on January 12, 1935. However, now this is how the, this is the loophole here. Ethel and IG Farben joined under the umbrella of Ethel GmbH. So basically it says, all right, you don't want our corporation to transfer any of these technologies to the Germans. So instead, what we'll do is we'll form a new corporation and have that corporation send the information to the Germans. <laughs> this is just genius. This is just, oh, wow. People are really smart. And I think the Americans are just really dumb. Um, the German Luftwaffe, uh, I believe that would be the German Air Force, required 500 tons of tetraethyl lead in 1934, I'm sorry, 1938, before the outbreak of war. The Ethel Export Corporation of New York loaned 500 tons to Ethel GmbH in Germany. So again, instead of operating under the Ethel Corporation of New York, they'll loan it to their subsidiary company in Germany. So we continue, said not only did Standard Oil put gas in the tanks of Germany, German military vehicles, they even provided the rubber for the wheels. Since, in 1938, Standard provide, provided IG Farben with its new butyl rubber process. To make matters worse, Standard Oil kept the German Buna process uh, a secret within the United States, and it was not until June 1940 that Firestone and U.S. rubber were allowed to participate in testing butyl 
and granted the huge manufacturing, the Buna manufacturing licenses. So uh, Germany was ahead of America as far as this rubber production was concerned. Uh, Sutton summarizes, he says, in other words, Standard Oil of New Jersey, first under President W.C. Teagle and then under W.S. Farish, consistently aided the Nazis war machine while refusing to aid the United States. This sequence of events was not an accident. Continues. The Standard Oil, Standard Oil had another German subsidiary. Um, this is DAPAG, D-A-P-A-G, which they owned 94% of. The branches of Standard Oil were intertwined with the Nazis. They had two directors at the company who were Kepler Circle members. And the payments from DAPAG to Kepler Circles didn't cease until 1944. The ITT company, the communications company, was accused of supplying German U-boats with intel while simultaneously warning other ships of, of torpedoes. The ITT company, with Wall Street money, was actually used to warn German U-boats of any impending threats. Uh, Thus, while ITT uh, Fock Wolf planes were bombing Allied ships and ITT lines were passing information to German submarines, ITT direction finders were saving other ships from torpedoes. Again, we see U.S. banking ties, including J.P. Morgan through his agent, Arthur M. Anderson, who was also a partner at the New York Trust Company. Others included Hernan Ben for Bank of America, Sosthenes Ben for National City Bank, F. Wilder Bellamy for Dominic and Dominic, John W. Cutler for Grace National Bank, Alan G. Hoyt for National City Bank, and Russell C. Uh, Leffingwell for J.P. Morgan and Carnegie Corporation, as well as others. So before and during World War II, multiple payments were made to the Nazi Heinrich Himmler through ITT's German subsidiary companies. Through ITT's purchase into Fock Wolf, they were profiting handsomely from the production of the same German planes that would kill American soldiers. Kurt von Schroeder sat on the board of all of ITT's German subsidiary companies. He was the banking mind for Hitler and the Nazis. In 1936, he linked with the Rockefellers and formed the Schroeder Rockefeller and Company, Inc., which was located at 48 Wall Street. And I think 48 Wall Street is actually a significant place. I think there's a bunch of companies inside that building, uh, at least at one point. Um, I have not done the uh, investigation into if it, those banks, uh, those companies still exist in that building. But let's continue. In 19, in uh, November, uh, wait, whoops, sorry, November 19, 1945, interrogation of Mr. Schroeder. The following exchange occurred in regard to ITT subsidiary company, C. Lorenz AG of Berlin. And uh, I'll just skip right here. They ask him, um, the full exchange is, well, not, well, most of the exchange is in, the, in my book, The Patriot Report, but I'm just going to skip to this part right here. It says, did you know or did you hear of any protests made by Colonel Ben or his representatives against these companies engaged in these activities preparing Germany for war? To which he responds, no. So Sutton wrote, somebody once said that 60 families have directed the destinies of the nation. It might well be said that if somebody would focus the spotlight on 25 persons who handled the nation's finance, finances, the world's real, real war makers would be brought into bold relief. Anthony Sutton, historian. Uh, on September 1st, 1933, Henry Mann of National City Bank. Uh, if you know about the um, previous chapter uh, about um, the, the manipulation of elections, you'll know, you'll remember the name National City Bank. And Winthrop W. Aldrich of Chase Bank met with Hitler and William Dodd and recorded, these bankers feel they can work with him. So this is the bankers. According to Schroeder, um, I'm sorry, this is um, Henry Mann and uh, uh, Winthrop Aldrich. You should recognize the name Aldrich. Um, and they met with uh, Hitler and William Dodd and recorded that they felt they could work with him, Hitler. 
July in a July uh, 15, 1949, sworn affidavit, James P. Warburg warned, he said, my associates, that Hitler would very likely come to power in Germany and that the result would be either a Nazi-dominated Europe or a Second World War, perhaps both. So he knew that there was some impending danger or threats of a uh, coming world war. So while Paul Warburg was director of the American IG Farben, Max Warburg was the director of the German IG Farben and co-signed with Hitler a document which pointed a Hallmark shot, shot to the Reichs Bank. Okay? So the Warburg family, one in America, one in Germany, cooperation with Hitler and the creation of a bank. Um, well, the appointment of Mr. Schott to the Reichs Bank, um, which I guess would affirm the bank put the firm under their control, who knows? To remove some doubt as to the collusion between JP Morgan and Chase being involved with the Germans, I will include some excerpts from a December 20, 1944, Treasury Department inter-office communication and recommendation for investigation. This is Secretary Morgenthau from Mr. Saxon. And uh, I'll read this entire exchange here. It says, Chase Bank Paris, so Niederman of Swiss nationality, Manager of Chase Paris was unquestionably a collaborator. Um, Chase head of office in New York was informed of Niederman's collaborationist policy, but took no steps to remove him. Indeed, there is ample evidence to show that the head office in New York viewed Niederman's good relations, good relations with the Germans as an excellent means of preserving unimpaired the position of the Chase Bank in France. C, the German authorities were anxious to keep the Chase to keep the chase open and indeed took exceptional measures to provide resources of revenue. D, the German authorities desired to be friends with the important American banks because they expected that these banks would be useful after the war as an instrument of German policy in the United States. F, the whole objective of the chase policy and operation was to maintain the position of the bank at any cost. Morgan and Company, France C. Morgan and Company, had tremendous prestige with the German authorities and the Germans boasted of a splendid cooperation of Morgan and company F Morgan and company constantly sought its ends by playing one government against another in the coldest and most unscrupulous manner. Uh, I continue here. I said, uh, I recommend that this investigation, no, this is, this is what they said. I'm sorry. They said, I recommend that this investigation, which for unavoidable reasons, has progressed slowly up until this time, should now be pressed urgently and that additional needed personnel be sent to Paris as soon as possible. So this is Secretary Morgenthau. This is uh, again, December 20th, 1944, Treasury Department Inter-Office Communication, recommendation for investigation. And uh, there was never a full investigation into this ma matter. That is, uh, the chapter on World War II. We're going to dive into uh, Bush now. Let's uh, let's pull up uh, Mr. Bush and let's um, let's find his wiki page because I believe that it's right here on his wiki page. They don't hide this stuff, so let me put that on your screen here. All right. So here we have Prescott Bush, and this is the father of uh, George Bush, Senior. Um, all right, let's read right here. It says, uh, President uh, Prescott Sheldon Bush was an American banker and politician. After working as a Wall Street eje executive investment banker, he represented Connecticut in the United States Senate. Uh, a member of the Bush family, he was uh, the father of former Vice President George H.W. Bush and a paternal grandfather of former Texas Governor President George W. Bush and former Florida Governor. Jeb Bush. Okay. Let's go to the next section. Uh, where is it? Okay. So right here, uh, United Banking Corporation says here, um, Bush was founder of one of seven directors of the Union Banking Corporation holding a single share out of 4,000 as a director. 
an investment bank that operated as a clearinghouse for many assets and enterprises held by German steel magnate Fritz Dyson. We talked about Fritz Dyson in the presentation. An early supporter and financier of the Nazi party. In July 1942, the bank was suspected of holding gold on behalf of Nazi leaders. A subsequent government investigation disproved those allegations, but confirmed Dyson's control. And in October 1942, the United States seized the bank under the Trading with the Enemy Act and held the assets for the duration of World War II. Journalist Duncan Campbell pointed out documents showing that Prescott Bush was director and shareholder of a number of, com number, number of companies involved with Dyson. Bush was the director of Union Bank Corporation and that represented Dyson's U.S. interests, continuing to work for the bank after America's entry into World War II. Historian Herbert uh, Parme agrees with the assessment that Bush was not a Nazi sympathizer. So, um, you'll have to, uh, you have to do your own research and come to your own conclusions on this. Obviously, uh, Wikipedia is going to say, the powers that be are going to say, oh, no, they didn't do nothing wrong. So right here, I'll just show you the double speak here. It says a subsequent government investigation disproved those allegations. Right? They're saying that the allegations of them, you know, um, holding gold on behalf of Nazis was not true. However, the bank was seized under the Trading with the Enemy Act. So is it? Uchi Wally Wally, or is it one Mike? Which one is it? Because if they weren't, they weren't guilty. Why was it seized? Why was why was the bank seized? And it claimed that they were not Nazi sympathizers. Yet you were definitely working with Dyson, so you're guilty, but you're not guilty because you were definitely working with Dyson. So I don't know what's going on with Wikipedia and their double speak. But uh, I'll leave those investigations up to you and let you draw your own conclusions. Uh, this is the end of today's um, presentation. And I'll uh, read some comments here from the chat. We'll look at the trending topics for today. I'm sure they're a mess. Um, and then um, get out of here. I'll chat with you guys for a little bit. Let me see here. Uh, Hotep's a diplomat. Whose history are we discussing? Their made up history based on the tree of knowledge technologies. Yours based on a tree of life, both of which reflect your relationship with the one God. IBM, he says, IBM supplied him with early computers. Mm -hmm. Why would American army be doing in European of England genocide of the continuum, I asked. Um, fun fact, Henry got a loan from his in-laws for Rockefeller to start the company. True story, it later became Exxon. Mm, yeah, also true. Um, very well-informed chat here. You guys are, are very intelligent people, informed people. Um, thank you to the moderators for cleaning up the chat. Jabari, you're doing such a great job um, cleaning up the chat. So the powers that be. Do not disrupt uh, the communications between myself and you, the beloved people. Let's go through the uh, trending topics and let's see what our overlords have to, are using to distract us with today. Let's see. Okay, I have no trending topics. Okay. Uh, let's try this again. Let's reload this. Trending. Fresh. Okay, there we go. Uh, Valentine's Day. Oh, yes, today's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day to all the ladies out there. I uh, hope you find love. And if you have not found love, learn to love yourself. I was um, in communications with a, a young woman. Uh, and uh, we were, uh, she's in the middle of a challenge. I challenged her to write daily. So she's a great writer. And uh, she failed to publish a piece. And I asked her, why didn't you publish the other day? And basically how the bet goes or the challenge goes is every time she fails to write daily, I send her a picture or a video and she has to post it to her IG stories. Then she informed me that she disabled her IG. And I'm like, why'd you disable your IG? She told me because she was heartbroken and to which I informed her that and she went into detail about her, her, her lust for love, I guess we can call it. And, um, her desire, her deep desire for love. She's a hopeless romantic. And uh, she gives into these uh, 
relationships that end and then she has anxiety and depression for months thereafter or a month. I don't know how long the depression lasts, but she has anxiety thereafter. And it's just a constant cycle. And I told her, uh, you should probably spend more time on yourself, loving yourself. I mean, you know, while you're loving these men who leave you right before Valentine's day, you're writing your blog, your, your career, your, your dreams, your aspirations have become back seat. You've put them in the back seat and let men ride in the front seat. I don't think that's a healthy way to live your life. So, um, she published a blog today that spoke about, uh, now she's going to love herself more and put herself uh, first more. And, uh, I think that's very important. We need a hotep dating site. <laughs> All right. We're going to make that happen one day. Um, Oscars, Twitter's top fan voted film will be recognized. I wonder if it's, is it going to be a male, female in Oscars this year or have men and women be deleted from the history books? Um, Amy Schumer, Schumer, uh, Regina Hall, Wanda Sykes eyed to host the Oscars. Cause everybody knows there's only one important, um, award show. And that is the Grifties. If you guys have not watched the latest and greatest Grifties, I suggest you do so. Uh, this is our premiere award show featuring people like Jason Whitlock, Rolo Tomasi, and more. So I strongly suggest you guys go ahead and enjoy this comedic presentation. And we're looking to have a red carpet um, event next year, to which I've already had a conversation with uh, the two sponsors, one of them political, another one a technology company. So we look to make that great. Love to see you all there and purchase tickets. Enjoy a VIP experience and have dinner with the Hoteps or just get a journal admission and um, party with us and enjoy the show. Let's go back to the training topics. New York Post, New York Post draws criticism. So yeah, New York Post, I saw this. Um, they said New York Post, or, 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 so they said Snoop Dogg smokes weed right before star-studded Super Bowl um, 2022 halftime show. Um, yeah, I don't know like what, why this is news um but uh like if you don't know that snoop uh, uh smokes a copious amounts of weed on a daily basis um you've been living underneath a moose uh, and i would uh, suggest you find something else to blog about especially since i believe it's legal to smoke marijuana in california it's very weird of the new york post to post that you know why, why? They felt the need to make us aware of Snoop's smoking habits, but thought everybody knew Snoop smokes copious amounts of weed. Anyway, uh, Sarah Palin, U.S. District Judge Jed Rockoff, found that Sarah Palin, the former uh, Alaska governor, did not present sufficient evidence to win a defamation lawsuit against the New York Times in a case. So she lost her case, okay. Um, for the rape. Um, Balance not to play this. What is this? Somebody is having a baby. Good for you. Congratulations. Baby in the future. Uh, Verizon customers across Georgia and other states are reporting internet and service outages. Yeah, my internet went out last night. It's quite odd. Um, what is Mazars? What is this? Breaking news on a daily beast. Donald Trent's longtime trusted accounting firm just ditched him. Mazars USA uh, says an entire decade of ex president's financial statements can't be trusted. Uh, firm sites and internal investigation. So again, they're just not taking their foot off Donald Trump's neck because I think they are afraid he might run and win the next election. Um, that is Kid Rock. Um, Nick Adams, a self-proclaimed favorite author of former President Donald Trump, draws criticism for a series of tweets about the Super Bowl halftime show performances. What 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 is what, is, what happened? Why? What, were people criticizing the halftime show? I thought the halftime show was pretty damn good. Maybe just because I'm black and I love hip hop and this was very nostalgic and I like Kendrick Lamar and this was 50 Cent. He's a great individual. He saved my life. Um, so I don't know. What did Kid Rock say, I guess? Um, I guess Kid Rock had a problem with, what did he say? Anybody have a quote? 
breakfast. Um, it says Eminem defies NFL and kneels in solidarity with Colin Kaepernick during the Super Bowl. Uh, I think that's fake news. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's fake news. I'm pretty sure he was kneeling because they did a tribute to Tupac. So Daily Beast being detached with, this is the problem with white liberals. They think they know what's going on and uh, they actually don't. Uh, but I believe this was a gesture to Tupac and white liberals have to do a better job, maybe get more black friends so you know what's going on. Um, still looking for this Kid Rock quote. I'll just Google it. Kid Rock. Halftime show. Kid Rock assures fans he will absolutely cancel any show on his upcoming tour if a venue requires fans to show proof of the jabby or any other potential safety protocols. Oh, this is good. Why are they mad? Money back. Uh, yeah, what, what, what? People are mad at this? I'm, you know, leftists in their status agenda. I stand with Kid Rock. Um, after a whirlwind of one month romance, Kanye West and actress uh, Julia Fox have called it quits. Shakari Richardson uh, sees double standard in handling of Camilla Baleva doping case. Um, let's look at this. This is, this is interesting. I saw some of this this morning. So apparently, um, a Russian figure skater, Camilla. Valieva was allowed to continue competing at the Beijing Olympics amid a doping charge on Monday, months after a positive test for cannabis derailed her own Olympic dreams. Okay, 21 year old expected. Da, 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 da. Let me get a solid answer. Which one is a positive? Not one black man is able to compete without a case ongoing. No, I don't. Give me what did give me the facts. I just want the facts. This appears to be another chapter in this man of disregard for a clean sport. CS ruling did not address the merits of a drug case. Now it says, no, 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 time out. No, 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 case. Okay. Uh, U.S. anti-doping agency CEO said only time will tell if she, Valieva, should be competing in these games and whether or not all her results would be disqualified. Uh, I said the, the U.S. came in second in the event. The Kremlin said it hoped to receive their medal soon. So here we go. So Valieva tested positive for the banned heart medication um, trimetazidine on December 25th at the Russian National Championships, but the result was not revealed until April, uh, February 8th after she had competed in, in, in the team event at the Winter Games. Um, so uh, I guess what they're saying is um, the sample in the case was not flagged. Priority sample. Laboratory did not know, did, did not know to fast track the analysis of the sample. American uh, posted at the end of the day, there was a positive test and there's no question in mind that she should not be allowed to compete. Regards of the age, time and results. So yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, um, uh, this this girl uh, tested positive for some doping. She was allowed to compete, but uh, Shakari Richardson, who tested positive, which is not performance enhancing allegedly, uh, was banned from the Olympics. Is this a double standard? Um, well, I don't think I have enough information to draw that conclusion. From a very cursory look, I would say this is a double standard. Uh, the things I call into question is, is it the same committee? Um, and um, the test that the young girl went under seems to be for a different event and not exactly this event. I don't know how this stuff works. Um, but uh, again, uh, my lack of information will not allow me to draw a 
and uh, an educated conclusion but it does from the very surface look to be a double standard and uh this young girl should probably be not allowed to compete but again i don't know the details so take what i say with a grain of salt i'd love to hear the experts deliberate on this a day without gribbon as protesters hold demonstrations in washington dc in observance with a day without um man, i wish people would cover the trucker the trucker uh protest which has been doing a, quite a fine job in canada um you can't keep living Stoneman Douglas, all right. U.S. to temporarily re relocate Ukraine embassy from Kiev, all right. Uh, C CBC News has learned that Justin Trudeau will inform the provinces he will invoke the Emergencies Act to give the government extra powers to deal with the protests across the country. Trudeau said there were no plans to deploy the military. So Trudeau, the dictator, uh, or the alleged dictator of uh, Canada who disrupted the economy is now mad that truckers are disrupting the economy. So rules for thee, none for me. Um, Wordle, yeah. Um, my mom and dad uh, told me about um, Wordle. And um, so I've been participating in that because, well, I just like participating in things that bring me closer to family. So we do that together. Uh, I am right now, I believe I'm two for two. I think Friday's night's word was ultra. I didn't know how to play the game, so kind of got it a little late. And yesterday's word was cynic, and I got that on uh, the fourth try. Uh, a rather interesting game. I think it took me uh, about 20 minutes to complete. I, I just like having things challenge my mind, so yeah. Uh, Naomi Campbell and her daughter uh, cover British Vogue. Okay, beautiful image. Wonderful, wonderful. Mama and baby, beautiful, love to see it. Uh, BlockFi, crypto firm BlockFi to pay record penalty to settle US SEC state charges. I'll probably look into that at a later date. Um, but again, SEC meddling in crypto business. Um, a mother was killed in her Manhattan apartment by a man who followed her into the building. Tragic. This is why you need guns in New York City. This is why New York City will not allow you to, or it's really hard to possess a, a weapon in New York City. And if you made it more accessible, uh, I think crime like crimes like this would go down. She could have defended herself, but hey, whatever. Um, sports news. Um, fans think that Celtics Jalen Browns will replace James Harden in NBA All Star Game. Following news that Harden will miss the exhibition due to hamstring injury, we discuss all of that on uh, our uh, site. For men, menoforder.com. Uh, beautiful, wonderful website for young men to help them enhance their uh, wealth and power. Make sure you go check out uh, the great information we have here and also subscribe to our YouTube channel where we discuss sports from a very interesting point of view. Also, if you would like some... Um, motivational quotes uh our instagram is dedicated to highlighting great men both uh past present and future uh and the uh, great things that they have said uh over the years Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, shout out to Chad Lemoyne, Halawe, and David Zantar for paying their tuition. Truly appreciate you for supporting the channel and allowing me to receive the funds to reinvest in the channel and make it even greater and better to bring you the truth, which I enjoy doing. It's a tremendous amount of work, but it's work that is rewarding, uh, both uh, mentally, but also spiritually. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I am Hotep Jesus. And I'll see you for the next stream. And tonight we'll be streaming chess on the Hotep Chess channel from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. with a very uh, challenging exercise with uh, international master Alejandro Moreno. I'll see you there. Hotep a bill. Love y'all.